invite our, our uh, distinguished panel members to join me up here. And um, so, um, first of all, please, Dr. John Mills. And I want to invite Dr. Hannah Ullman. שהיא פסיכולוגית קלינית, פסיכואנטיקאית מנחה וחברה במכון תל אביב לפסיכואנליזה בת זמננו ולשעבר יו"ר המכון. חנה מלמדת ומדריכה במסלול ההתייחסותי בבית הספר לפסיכותרפיה, בבית הספר לרפואה על שם זאטר באוניברסיטת תל אביב, היא מדריכה בבית הספר לפסיכותרפיה בבר אילן. דוקטור רומן היא מהמקימים של הפורום הישראלי לפסיכואנליזה ופסיכותרפיה התייחסותית. חברת, חברת ההנהלה של הארגון הבינלאומי לפסיכואנליזה ופסיכותרפיה התייחסותית, למעשה הנשיאה של הארגון, נבחרת, והיא מחברת את הספר The Transformed Self, The Psychology of Religious Conversion, ומאמרים שונים על תיאוריה התייחסותית והתהליך האנליטי. אני רוצה להזמין גם את דוקטור שלומית ידלין גדות, פסיכולוגית קלינית, חברה במכון הפסיכואנליטי בתל אביב, לפסיכואנליזה בעצמנו. עמיתת הוראה במסלול פסיכואנליזה ופרשנות ביחידה ללימודים בין תחומיים באוניברסיטת בר אילן. עבודת הדוקטורט שכתבה עסקה בקשר בין תפיסות אמת שונות בחשיבה הפילוסופית לבין תפיסות פסיכואנליטיות של עצמיות מרובה. היא חוקרת פוסט-דוקטורנטית בנושא של האתיקה של הפסיכואנליזה באוניברסיטת תל אביב. אני רוצה להזמין את דוקטור לירן רזינסקי, מרצה בתוכנית לפרשנות ותרבות באוניברסיטת בר אילן. תחומי המחקר שלו הם התיאוריה הפסיכואנליטית, ספרות צרפתית וכללית ומחשבה צרפתית. מאמריו הופיעו בכתבי עת דוגמת uh, Psychoanalytic Study of the Child, The Psychoanalytic Review, Contemporary Psychoanalysis, Yale French Studies, Modern Language, Quarterly um, ועוד. Um, הספר שלו, Freud Psychoanalysis in Death, יצא לאור לאחרונה בהוצאת קיימברידג'. Um, דוקטור מירב רוט. פסיכואנליטיקאית, מנחה בחברה הפסיכואנליטית בישראל, ראש המסלול ללימודי המשך בפסיכותרפיה פסיכואנליטית קלייניאנית בתוכנית לפסיכותרפיה באוניברסיטת תל אביב, עורכת הספר מלאני קליין, כתבים נבחרים, ביחד עם שוקי דורבן בהוצאת תולעת ספרים. ואני רוצה להזמין, חסר כיסא, נכון? אוקיי, okay, <laughs> תודה. אני רוצה להזמין את דוקטור בועז שלגי, פסיכולוג קליני, ראש התוכנית לפסיכותרפיה בבית הספר לרפואה. באוניברסיטת תל אביב ומרצה במחלקה לפסיכולוגיה באוניברסיטת בר אילן. תכף נסתר פה עוד כיסא, בינתיים בואו ונתחיל. חנה, רשות הדיבור שלך. אוקיי, שומעים מפה? כן. and for your uh, introduction now offer and for your warm introduction this morning, Ganer, to the. It is not without hesitation that I accepted Ganer's and offer's invitation to participate in this panel. The title of this conference, the relational approach response to its critics, is already problematic, it seems to me. It places the relational approach in the role of the defendant, challenging us to claim defensively, not guilty, not guilty as charged. I asked myself how it is that, to the best of my knowledge, we never had a conference entitled the Kleinian or the Freudian approach response to its critics as we have today with respect to the relational approach. I believe part of the answer is obvious. It is an important assumption of the relational approach that questions, constant reflection, and comparative dialogue are essential for the advancement of theory and practice in psychoanalysis. The psychoanalytic dialogues, the relational journal, which this year became the, lead the leading journal in psychoanalysis, was founded on the idea of critical dialogue with each paper followed by critical discussions. And I encourage uh, those of you who get the psychoanalytic dialogues to really look at the latest issue uh, of the dialogues, which has an important panel really addressing some of the questions that we're discussing here in a very uh, meaningful, I think, and deep way, including a paper by Salingman that you quoted from 2003, from 2003 who now who talks about the, the intrapsychic and the need to maintain the balance between the internal and the relational. Anyway. Similarly, from a relational perspective, the psychoanalytic process itself 
hinges on the capacity of the analyst not only to point out to patients their defensive maneuvers, self-destructiveness, or strength, but also on our willingness as analysts to examine our own participation and contributions to failure, stalemates, or even harm. Re-examining our theoretical claims, staying in the depressive position vis-a-vis -vis our own convictions, being open to alternative formulations is where the relational approach started, and I believe it is this openness which accounts for its growth. As such, the relational approach invites critical dialogue, and in this respect, I welcome and I appreciate the opportunity for this dialogue. However, reading the two talks that we heard this morning, and even more so, previous writings, Miles' previous writings against the relational approach, I found myself thinking about the fine line between constructive intellectual exchanges and pointing the fingers at the other's faults. Despite points of, ag despite points of agreement with the speaker, I found myself objecting to the discourse wishing for a rendering of ideas that does not rely on presenting colleagues in the worst possible light, on pushing to the extreme, on creating straw men that are then vehemently destroyed. With the Israeli elections approaching, this is the kind of debate that can easily deteriorate, that we can expect to hear on our media, and that we do not need in our professional life. In a paper entitled A Plea for Constructive Dialogue, Altman and Davis suggest that constructive dialogue has to do with presenting the other's point of view in the best possible light. They ask, why is it that our theoretical exchanges are as colorful and as interesting as overboiled potatoes? We find ourselves responding to the same tired stereotypes. The caricatures are familiar to all of us. The relational analyst is portrayed as narcissistic, impulsive, more interested in his own subjectivity than the patient's world and needs, and as a radical relativist guided by postmodern ideology rather than professional knowledge and ethics. This is about as truthful as the stereotype of the Freudian analyst as always unresponsive, cold, rigid, superior, authoritarian. Perpetuating the same tired stereotypes, we never engage in the really interesting questions. Having said that, and in the little time that we have. I wish to focus on two points that emanate from Mal's criticism and try to reformulate them into questions that I believe are important questions that we need to ask in contemporary psychoanalysis, relational or not. My first point concerns the equation explicit and implicit of relational theory with radical postmodernism. There is much that I can agree with in Miles' criticism of postmodernism, and indeed, in some relational writings, the pendulum has swung too far to that side. Relational perspective is indeed influenced by postmodernism. In that respect, it is similar to most contemporary disciplines in the social and liberal arts. It would have been a frozen, isolated, dead psychoanalysis if we did not let culture and zeitgeist breathe through our concepts and our practice. In the same way, as I think Anner said too, in the same way Freud was influenced deeply by the science and culture of his time. Postmodernism's contribution is invaluable in shaking the monolithic hegemony of one dominant voice in culture and in psychoanalysis. I believe hegemony breeds stagnation. Postmodernism is invaluable in freeing us from the simplistic assumption that there is only one person in our office who views the reality in an objective, rational way, and that there is one truth waiting to be revealed, uncovered by the analyst knowledge. This liberating influence that is at, at the foundations of the relational approach is, however, a far, a far cry from the claims that equate relational theory with radical postmodernism. It does not mean relativism, nor does it mean that there is no reality and no natural constraints. Attributing this to the relational approach is a straw man. There is a reality outside our constructions, but social reality and the reality inside the treatment room is always ambiguous, subject to married, although not unlimited, number of interpretations. 
the fact that contemporary psychoanalysis is not one but many, that psychoanalysts can be Freudian, Kleinian, Kohutian, Winokutian, Lacanian, etc., already means that alternative constructions of the mind are possible and that the intrapsychic is not readily discernible except via the theoretical constructions and the intersubjective mutual exchange between patient and analyst. Mutuality certainly does not mean equality. This is another straw man. It means constant mutual influence impacting both partners in the dialogue. I see the relational approach proposing universals that one can agree or disagree with, but certainly not as advocating relativism. The relational approach is founded on several naturals or universals. Let me focus on one. It is that the drives are subsumed by the primacy of relationships. Thus, a fundamental claim is that psychic change rests in the encounter of two minds in which we try to hold and understand not only the intrapsychic, but the inextricably linked choreography of two sets of unconscious experience. This is very much in keeping with what we have come to understand from the most contemporary research on early parent-child interaction and the centrality of dyadic experience to the neurobiological developments essential to psychic functioning. In this respect, relational theory is in fact more closely linked to positivistic claims emanating from research on attachment, trauma, developmental psychopathology, etc., than any other psychoanalytic approach. So here is a question that I think we should all consider. How do we reconcile the objective knowledge that comes from empirical research and other sources, medical, cultural, and how do we use it in this most intimate subjective encounter in which we are flawed observers as well as participants? My second point has to do with the issue of self-disclosure, specifically with Jody Davis' famous papers, for example, Love in the Afternoon, so often used as the red flag raised over and over again as if this disclosure of erotic counter-transference is the hallmark of the relational approach. There is a lot that, re that relational analysts do between the colorful moments of enactments and self-disclosures. Framing the question as this question of technique, of whether to disclose or not to disclose, obscures the more fundamental issues raised by Jody Davis's by now classical papers. Davis challenges us to examine the inevitably seductive nature of the psychoanalytic encounter in the psychoanalytic frame. Her writings, as well as others, uh, for example, Jessica Benjamin, theoretically challenge the Oedipal complex reformulating it as an edible complexity and reaching our understanding of the developmental vicissitudes and implications of love, desire, and hate between child and parent. She, as well as others, draws our attention to the distinction between specific intentional analytic <coughs> interventions and the kind of unconscious analytic participation that goes on continuously and exists as a harmonic or discordant ongoing leitmotiv to our more thoughtful and rational choices. In other words, we make thoughtful and rational choices, but there is also something else that is going on. At the end of Freud's Transference Love, Freud writes about the general reaction to his paper that will alert the world to the dangers of the psychoanalytic method. Psychoanalysis, like Psychoanalysts, like chemists, work with explosives, he says, but it would never occur to us to forbid chemists their work because of the risks involved. We cannot give up a psychoanalysis which dares to explore the most explosive human, human emotions so as to allow the patient to bring them into better control. Davis invites us to do just that. Explore the erotic in the psychoanalytic relationship, including the countertransference, as the elephant in the analytic room. She dares us to own, it seems to me, the meaning of Adam Phillips, no, not exactly a relationist, provocative statement, psychoanalysis is what happens when two people agree not to have sex. She breaks new grounds and is left, Davis, breaks do, new grounds and is left to tackle all the problems that emerge. But the problems are there for all of us to struggle with. The question is, 
Is there a space that is neither one of exploitation nor one of denial of what is clearly going on in their relationship? The question is one of recognizing that we are creating the experience even as we are studying it. Relational theory grew out of the criticism of existing psychoanalytic models and offered new, new solutions. There are no new solutions that do not create new problems. But it is the readiness to question, the readiness to live with the inherently enigmatic and with diverse answers that ensures the vitality of psychoanalysis. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, very, very much. And now, Shlomit Yadling Gadot, Vakisha. I wish to address your critique of the postmodern turn in relational psychoanalysis, your first lecture, and begin by stating its immense importance. It forces us to rethink and reformulate our ideas about relational psychoanalysis and its theory's basic tenets. It encourages us to formulate technique and methodology. I will begin by discussing shortly issues of epistemology, objectivity, and truth in psychoanalysis, and end in a related fashion by touching upon our motivation for constructing theories and our ways of validating them. The, different, the difficult grappling with issues of objectivity and truth hasn't begun with a relational turn, but rather with the earliest days of psychoanalytic theory. Freud strove to establish psychoanalysis on the basis of scientific truth, simultaneously anchoring its standing among the sciences and supplying a rationale for clinical technique. When stating in 1937 that an assured conviction of the truth of the construction achieves the same therapeutic result as a recaptured memory, Freud acknowledges two additional truths, coherent and pragmatic. The former manifests in the patient's acceptance of a construction, the latter in its therapeutic effects. While remaining a staunch believer in the correspondence theory of truth, he acknowledges the functioning and relevance of these truths on the level of, of experiencing and on the level of validation of theory. Following Freud, psychoanalytic truth splintered into a multiplicity of truths. Subjective, ideal, intersubjective, coherence, and pragmatic truths appeared, respectively, in the work of Winnicott, Kohut, Mitchell, Schaefer, and Spence. Some saw this as a setback in the theory's ability to attain scientific standing. Others focused on the potency and potential of these developments in creating a diversity of guidelines for achieving mental therapy. These developments regarding truth were encountered inside the clinic, apprehended as relevant for understanding and processing the experience of our patients. The related theories describing their functioning did not necessarily entail the denial of realistic truth. When Kohut or Winnicott championed subjective truths, they were not denying objective realities, but rather questioning their relevant positioning in the processes and service of therapeutic progress. Schaefer advocating the, the potency of narratives, namely of coherent truth, was not denying the epistemology of realism. Rather, he highlighted and emphasized the centrality of the coherence theory of truth in psychic makeup and particularly in the analytic process. So actually, long before the relational turn, psychoanalysis was developing theory and practice in the light of different perspectives of truths. When discussing truth in the multiple form, we shift from traditional metaphysics, from the simplicity and clarity of the true-false subjective-objective divide. But I think it's safe to say that we remain in the confines of legitimate epistemological discussion. We have not yet, even with the help of Hegel, found our way to Kant's thing in itself. Our consciousness remains standing between what we know and what truly is the mind-independent reality out there around us. We acknowledge its existence, but know it only in a mediated fashion. We mold and remold our realities by means of different epistemologies. In the words of philosopher and psychoanalyst Gemma Karadi Fiumara, speaking of reality, we are not referring to the world in itself. 
but rather to the sort of reality which the individual laboriously carves out is a construct negotiated within the limits of what may be thought and done within his symbolic horizon. Before we decide to inhabit a specific epistemology, we may have gone through several epistemological migrations. My basic contention is that we do not decide in which epistemology to dwell. Rather, our basic psychological needs determine our multiple existence within several definable epistemologies. The truths governing our lives are realistic, corresponding to what we perceive as facts. They're also subjective, cohering with what we feel. We plan and live in accordance with intersubjective truths, be they of myth, cultural or parental decrees, often not even aware that they are rooted in interpersonal agreements. We consider and act upon our ideal truths as grounded in our principles and ethics. Similarly, foreseeing practical implications of our decisions, we define our pragmatic truths. All serve as mental guidelines, all our experiences truths, all may be traced to recurring philosophical arguments. Viewed from this perspective, the relational turn may be grasped as incorporating a particular epistemology into the sphere of psychoanalytic theoretical thinking. Its intersubjective epistemology is an essential pivotal one in the multiple epistemologies of the mind, one through which the individual finds and forms the reality common to him in his social human environment. As I understand it, the co-construction of reality in the clinic, as described by relational theorists, roughly repeats what we take as occurring in early developmental stages when a child co-constructs his reality with and guided by his parents. This basic tenet of early development is repeated in maturity in certain dimensions of lived experience, negotiated consciously and unconsciously with significant others. So to reiterate, when accepting that psychoanalysis dwells in the realm of multiple truths, we acknowledge a few essential premises of the psychoanalytic field. Firstly, we stand outside the strictly traditional metaphysics of one truth. Secondly, we retain the need for truths as organizing principles, as Archimedean points for our consciousness. Thirdly, we acknowledge the reality exterior to us, but realize that it is grasped in a, mediate, in a mediated manner. Fourthly, we presume that our construals of this partly known reality are determined by psychological needs that lend themselves to observation and inquiry. Accepting the fact that the human psyche dwells in parallel realities and moves among different epistemologies is not the same as saying that everything is relative or that anything goes. As you have so well described, the eagerness to escape the despotism of the metaphysical has run us into the illnesses of postmodernism. But in addressing them, we may not necessarily fall back on the simplicity of true and false. Rigorous epistemological inquiry may show that beyond metaphysical certainty and without falling into relativism, the human psyche constitutes several realities by means of several definable epistemological roots. Careful observation may show that it's possible to follow the needs motivating these roots, the logic of their construction, and the grammar governing them. Seen in this manner, the point would be to apprehend the rich insights of relational theorists, showing the constitution, logic, and workings of an intersubjective epistemology, noting its singular characteristics such as heavy reliance on language and the experience of permeable personal boundaries. This doesn't necessarily indicate the negation or denial of other crucial epistemologies and truths in the psychoanalytic field or in the clinic. On the contrary, taking a bird's eye view of the psychoanalytic theory and practice, we may notice that different schools create a het heterogeneous arc which parallels the epistemic multiplicity of the mind. In the vignette you offered, I think you actually exemplified the workings of several truths. You underlined the realistic one, but in my mind, we're working with others as well. You approached your patient with a, with a pragmatic truth detailing the consequences of his fantasy had he acted upon it. 
I believe you touched upon the patient's ideal truths as well. Does he truly think of himself as a murderer? You highlighted these truths in contradiction to the intersubjective truth that was ruling his mind at the time, one that comprised only of murderers and victims. I believe you could not have done this work had you not acknowledged his basic subjective truth, that he had been terribly, unforgivably injured and wronged. In the clinic, we walk with our patients through their different epistemologies, formulating some, almost always processing in different ways also those unformulated. We acknowledge the simultaneity of the realities they create, respecting their derivative truths. We needn't force these truths to converge or to mesh in the dynamics of a synthetic dialect dialectic. Rather, a different method methodological approach based on the rationale presented would be to detail and depict the various truths, locating tensions between them, as well as their conscious, unconscious, or dissociated positionings within the psyche. This might elaborate and refine our understanding of selfhood and agency, rather than relinquishing either as construct or concept. In this approach, epistemic analytic authority is not given up, but reconceptualized as what enables a therapist to do good epistemo epistemological work identifying the languages of truth that govern his and his patient's psychic processes, as well as the responses to them, attempting to engage their various dialects in a dialogue that appreciates and upholds their differences and singularities. At its best, this dialogue holds the potential of unraveling dynamics of dissociation, denial, and repressive authoritarianism, creating a space in which the experience of possibility and reflective deliberate choice replaces restriction and inevitability. We construe our realities, and it stands to reason that we do this in certain universal ways, which we may be piecing together in different areas of psychoanalytic theory. I've tried to offer a way of thinking about this epistemologic, epistemological multiplicity. The test of this way of thinking will be, in part, in its correspondence to reality. But that might not suffice. If theorizing will not have value of a pragmatic truth, enable us to work more creatively than before, if it will not lend more coherence to its applied field, if it does not create a common intersubjective truth, if it does not add a touch of the ideal wholeness or beauty, well, then it might be realistic, but it might not be good enough. Thank you very much, Lomit. And now, Dr. Liran Razinsky, please. No PowerPoint, you have to look. Okay, uh, thank you for two very rich and intriguing lectures. I will be focusing on the first one. While I have uh, reservations, I certainly find myself in agreement with some of your points, and I think that your discussion brings up very important issues. Listening to you, you seem very angry when you talk about the postmodern trends in relational psychoanalysis. Why are you so angry about John? You talk about postmodernists the way right wing people here talk about post-Zionists. They linger on the S, the post-Zionist, like leftist. They see them everywhere to trust a right wing person. 90% of the population here are post-Zionists. I bring that up because I think that your attack on postmodernism is to some extent attacking a boogeyman, a uh, dakhlil, uh, that you yourself seem to create. I kept on wondering what is that extreme form of postmodernism that you have so much trouble with? And I acknowledge that it, in North uh, American universities this is uh, uh, much more current than here, so maybe that's the reason I don't uh, see. I would be less concerned if you went into detail telling me who exactly you attack and which ideas exactly you wish to disentangle, referring to something I can grasp hold of, a text, a citation, you settle here for very vague paraphrases of postmodern notions that you raise yourself and then attack. I'm really not sure that it is helpful to turn one's opponent into a caricature. Postmodernism is, well, in its better moments, a complex position that acknowledges tensions. Now, I have no wish to be a defender of postmodernism, uh, but still, does it have to be reminded that if there was a need to surpass and transcend modernity, it was because the latter had some problems about it? 
if you widen it to the Enlightenment, the critique of the Enlightenment was not an arbitrary theoretical maneuver. It was necessitated by theories and ideas that could no longer be held. It was called for by injustice and oppression done in the name of Enlightenment to minority groups and people, to all, to all those groups that the Enlightenment did not include in its vision of mankind. It was required also because of the disastrous outcomes of what many see as the direct result of modernity, World War II, the Holocaust, and the atomic bomb. Critics like Adorno, Arendt, and uh, Zygmunt Bauman see such catastrophic events not as opposed to the Enlightenment and modernity, but rather as realizing it in a profound sense. You choose in the paper to attack relations, uh, relational psychoanalysis through its adaptation of post, uh, postmodern ideas. And yet, what you care about is these ideas. I think th the thing I find troublesome in the paper is that you do not address the ideas directly in their original creation sites, but rather you attack those who use them. You offer no analysis, let alone reference, to any of those mean French philosophers that are responsible for these ideas. I would expect that if the problem is with Foucault, Lyotard, Derrida, Deleuze, Baudrillard, you would try to address their thought directly in your paper, which you don't do. Instead, you criticize the relational analysts who employ these ideas. So basically, forgive the military metaphor, your problem is with the general, but you only address the soldiers. But when you address the soldiers, you don't talk with them about tactics, but about strategy. So there is a problem here, I think. Um, Trying to figure out what really bothers you, I take my lead from your footnote, which uh, you haven't seen in the PowerPoint, but it appears in the text we got, uh, where you do mention two names. So I quote you, when analysts use terms such as construction, hence invoking Foucault, and I skip, or even worse, deconstruction, thus exalting Derrida, the king of postmodernism, whose entire corpus is devoted to annihilating any, any metaphysical claims whatsoever, thus collapsing everything into undecidability, ambiguity, chaos, and chance. But in doing so, analysts open them, uh, themselves up to misunderstanding and co controversy, subsequently inviting criticism. Even aside Foucault, I want to talk about a bit about Derrida, the king of postmodernism. Let us leave the soldiers and the generals. Let us bring on stage the king himself. <laughs> is Derrida's delicate deconstruction of Western metaphysics irresponsible? Is it malicious? I believe rather that the very slow analytic work in, uh, in Derrida, done through meticulous close readings of canonical texts, testifying exactly to the con testifies exactly to the contrary. He does not dismiss things. He works through them uncovering with great patience the false propositions on which they lie and their internal contradictions. He shows classic Western beliefs and positions to be untenable. But let us talk for a moment about Derrida's position on the subject. Derrida does not refute subjectivity. It is an author whose prose and philosophy are deeply personal, more than any other philosopher, an author who wrote an autobiography, an author whose goal is exactly to show how abstract, impersonal theoretical systems and ideas tend to be interwoven with the person who utters them. Derrida's critique of, of the subject does not mean that there is no internal world or subjectivity. What his project regarding the subject amounts to is to show that the idea that this subject can be a foundation and the source of certainty and origin is untenable. Derrida shows that the idea of a moment, even if metaphorical, of self-presence, of a kind of closed circuit when one hears oneself speak, where one can be like a Cartesian cogito, present to him or herself in full self-presence and transparency, this self is an illusion. <coughs> he shows that one is always at some distance with oneself, that the self is layered and not monolithic. Moreover, the most profound text of Derrida on the subject draw directly on, in, on his analysis of Freud. Suffice to mention here, Freud in the scene of writing, a text in which tracing the textual metaphors of Freud, where Freud characterizes the psyche as text and as a writing machine, tracing these uh, lines in, in Freud, Derrida shows the psyche, psyche's internal difference with itself and the absence of an original central point. You say, and in your book, this claims rings even more strongly that postmodernism is against all Western philosophical tradition. 
it seems to be a problem in itself for you that it's against tradition. Well, well, would it lead, lead us? Well, I, I want to ask you, well, in, in, this, in this Western tradition, would you mind if I include the sophists with their attack on the concept of truth? The Hellenistic skeptics like Sextus Empiricus? Can I list the 16th century uh, philosopher and essayist Michel de Montaigne and his essay on the inconsistency of our actions? where Montaigne claims that an, a unified self is not something one can find. Rather, I cite Montaigne, that's a quote of Montaigne, we do not go, we are driven, like things that float, now leisurely, then with violence, according to the gen gentleness or rapidity of the current. There is no self, Montaigne asserts. We, I quote him again, change like that little creature which receives its color from what is laid upon. Um, do you see, as part of this cherished Western tradition, postmodernism supposedly defies, the canonic canonical philosopher David Hume, refuting, as you know very well, the existence of any stable identity of the self as an underlying essence for our actions, and claiming instead that our self is nothing but a bundle of perceptions. Eged shel tchush um, How about Nietzsche and his critique of the notion of the I? I haven't even started with the 20th century. Oh, you know what? Let me list with just one more name. It uh, very often noted as a precursor of postmodernism. Post one certain Zygmunt, what's his name? Freud, a Viennese citizen and a patriarch you might perhaps have heard of, to be sure, but who um, also wanted to give a blow to enlightenment notions of rationality, moral progress, and the idea of transparency of the self to itself. Very much like postmodernism. While my time is almost up, uh, I do want to say w another thing. I wanted to highlight the imp an important aspect of your work that might go unnoticed and is very important to me. I think it is a wonderful thing that what you are doing is discussing psychoanalytic practices and theories from a philosopher's point of view, examining them as the theories, looking at them as part of humanities. This is a great thing, I, I think. I'm very uh, concerned by tendencies in the psychoanalytic world to hide from the humanities, to avoid intellectual discourse, to treat every intellectual discussion as intellectualization, as distance from what really matters, so, uh, as it were. Psychoana psychoanalysis, I claim, is not open enough to a dialogue with the humanities. I wish to argue for the importance of much more acceptance of humanities-informed reading of psychoanalysis. Such accept acceptance clearly involves the, the question of who can write on psychoanalysis, who can interpret it uh, and develop it. It also involves indirectly the issue of the sources of authority of psychoanalytic texts. As things stand today, both <coughs> conceptually and in the practice of publications, journals, etc., psychoanalysis closes itself off from the possibility of being read, augmented, or challenged by reading that, readings that come from the humanities. Psychoanalysis should, I believe, find its way back to the humanities. The recent turn in, uh, to neuroscience and to general psychology and the need to measure in outcome studies is distancing psychoanalysis from its essence. But psychoanalysis is rooted in meaning. Dialogue with the humanities, the sciences of meaning, would help psychoanalysis reconnect with its core. This is part of what we try to do here at Bar in the program. Now, within psychoanalysis, one of the characteristics of the relational school is exactly that much more than any other school except the Lacanians, it was open to influences from the humanities. Mitchell himself is a reader of philosophy, and of course other names such as Aaron, Benjamin, and Storlow uh, could be evoked here. Now, although what I like about your work is exactly that it, uh, this bringing in of philosophical discourse into psychoanalysis, and although this is exactly the feature I like best ab uh, about relations with psychoanalysis, I'm slightly perplexed by the fact that this dialogue with philosophy is, is exactly what you oppose in relational thought. Of course, as a philosopher, you would not accuse them of being philosophical, but what I read in, in your text is something similar. You accuse them of integrating philosophical thought of a certain kind. You would be happy, as it were, uh, if they were more modernist, adopting notions of progress, rationality, the self, meta-theory, etc. What I want to argue, argue very briefly, that it is with other lines of thought in humanities that those, than those you cherish that psychoanalysis should seek to dialogue. 
I would urge psychoanalysis to explore its affinity not only with humanities in general, but much more specifically with what I call the critical humanities or the critical ethos of the humanities. An ethos within the humanities that sets itself the task of criticizing existing power structures and questioning given identities. So thinkers like Marx, uh, Freud, uh, Nietzsche, uh, the post-structuralist in France, and, and Freud, of course, uh, the Frankfurt School uh, could be named here. This uh, critical ethos of the humanities in the humanities is aiming towards destabilizing structures, exploring hidden power relations, relations, and putting solid identities in question. The critical ethos, and within it postmodernism, is deconstructing the over-encroachment of meta-narratives and ideologies in our lives, protesting the illusion that arbitrary notions imposed on us are natural and therefore eternal. It is a moment, movement of liberation. As a critical ethos, it almost necessarily meets with resistance. Psychoanalysis, however, faces a very similar situation. Psychoanalysis, too, is a practice that challenges the patient's existing identities, roles, reactions, patterns, and explores his or her hidden structures. And like the critical humanities, while aiming at a benevolent effect, it meets with resistance in treatment, to be sure, but also on the cultural level, the, the resistance to psychoanalysis as, as a theory. This equivalence is one reason to be careful when criticizing psychoanalytic uh, stances for their affinity with postmodernism that really might play into the hands of the resistance to psychoanalysis. Not liking the relation of school specifically because it questions notions of truth and identity seems to me too awfully close to not liking psychoanalysis per se, Freudian clan, and what have you, for psychoanalysis questions precisely these notions. It is exactly with, the cri with this critical ethos of humanities that I would like to see psychoanalysis dialoguing much more intensively. You say at the beginning of your lecture, and I finish here, that, I quote you, among the postmodern assumptions that you, uh, that you oppose are the abnegation of the Enlightenment modern notions of rationality, objectivity, epistemic certainty, truth, universal absolutes, individuality, and free will and positivistic science, just to name a few, end quote. Well, as I said, I wish to encourage psychoanalysis to explore its affinities with the critical ethos of humanities. It will be helpful, in guise of conclusion, to recall that the undermining of enlightenment modern notions of rationality, objectivity, positivistic science, epistemic certainty, and free will is actually the heart of Freud's Copernican revolution in the discovery of the unconscious. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liran. And now to Boaz Shalgi. Boaz is a psychologist, clinic, Rosh Hashanah, the psych. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. I have I have the wrong uh, the wrong order on the list. Sorry. Um, yeah, Dr. Merav Rot. I beg your pardon. Psychoanalytic guide, man, a chab, a chabra, psychoanalytic in Israel. Rosh Hashanah, the limud, the shech, the psychotherapy, psychoanalytic clinic, in the clinic of psychotherapy, University of Tel Aviv. עורכת הספר מלאני קליין, כתבים נבחרים ב', יחד עם יהושע דורבן, בהוצאה גדולה על ספרים. I was invited to bring a Kleinian glimpse into the important and complex ideas raised in Mill's papers. I will focus my comment on the Kleinian understanding of the nature of projective identification and discuss its implications concerning two issues, the exploration of the analyst's sub subjectivity by the patient and the use of self-disclosure. Klein, Klein laid the foundations for the understanding of the psychoanalytic encounter as a relational experience. As Stephen Mitchell wrote, contemporary Kleinian thinking has moved increasingly from a one-person psychology to a two-person perspective in its understanding of mind in general and the interaction between the two participants in the analytic situation. Klein put emphasis on the idea that in unconscious fantasy there is no experience occurring outside the context of the relation to the object. The crying baby does not feel my stomach is aching. Rather, he has a fantasy which sounds something like my object causes me stomach pain. A second crucial step is taken when Klein discovers projective identification. 
Thanks to Bian's contribu contribution of the communicational aspects of projective identification, which also influenced the external object, and thanks to the important developments made by other contemporary Kleinians, such as Betty Joseph, Rosenfeld, and others, the Kleinian theory and technique came to acknowledge the analytic encounter as a relational experience. And a great deal of writing is dealing with the critical implications of this realization. Where well, lays the difference then? Let's address the first point. I will argue why it is less reasonable from a Kleinian perspective to invite the patient to explore the analyst's subjectivity. I think it has to do with the question raised by the contemporary relational psychoanalyst and writer Galita Atlas, who is the relational baby? And I add, and how is he different from the Kleinian one? Klein believed that the mind is multidialectical, -dialect constantly perpetuating in movement between self and other, life and death instincts, love and hate, projection and internalization, fantasy and reality, and between the paranoid schizoid and depressive position. In Kleinian practice, though, emphasis is laid on the working through in the total situation of the transference of the more primitive, even psychotic parts of the personality, because it is believed that these are the parts which cause the patient most of his sufferings. These parts, by definition, distort reality testing, including the highly project projected, i.e. distorted, perceptions of the other. Projective identification is understood not only as a communicational normal mechanism, but also as a primitive defense used massively by the more disturbed parts of the personality, accompanied by other mechanisms characteristic of the paranoid schizoid position, such as splitting, denial, and an omnipotent effort to control the object from within. All these subjugate the, the self and the other and distort their internal appearances and external relations. The patient is afraid that his needs will not be met and is envious of the other who is perceived by him as someone who has it all. So he's trying to gain false control over him. These are not accusations of the patient as they are sometimes wrongly understood. but deeply empathic understandings concerning the patient's terrible anxiety and unbearable pain connected with being separate from his object. When the patient is using massive project identification, we assume that he is struggling to disidentify, to rid himself of unbearable parts of by projecting them into the other, or, on the contrary, trying to invest him with good parts in order to mend and repair him. In both cases, he's suffering from great confusion between self and other. His transference relation is colored by these massive projections, and so he's not able to identify who is who, and to meet the other's subjectivity buried underneath the influence of his projections. And as Betty Joseph wrote, we don't want to put our efforts into the more sane adult parts of the personality while neglecting the working through of the parts which need our help the most. Furthermore, in these areas of his object relations, he does not often use symbolic language, but instead suffers from the dominance of symbolic equations, which force the delusion of sameness between internal parts and external objects. It is exactly that ability of exploring, as opposed to projecting, that is impaired, and the patient is not able to use. Instead, he is trapped in vicious cycles of anxiety and primitive defense mechanisms and that is exactly where he needs our help. So if we go back to the possibility of exploring the subjectivity of the analyst in the relational technique, which is so beautifully described in the writings of great clinicians and thinkers whom I deeply appreciate and enjoy reading, such as Lou Aaron, Thomas Ogden, for example, we can see that in the Kleinian view, the relational aspect is very differently used. The analyst is invited to feel all that is projected onto and into him as vividly as possible. But yet, there is a basic assumption that the parts of the patient that we want to concentrate upon in analysis perceive a picture of the analyst highly distorted by anxiety and by massive use of primitive defense mechanisms. Furthermore, we do believe that the analyst does hold better judgments to what is going on in the relational encounter, and he is better equipped to deal with universal sorrows and anxieties not because he is superior in any way to his patient, 
but because first he has undergone a long analysis, and second, the analyst is not the one on the couch right now, so he's less regressed than his patient. There is therefore serious uh, asymmetry between transference and countertransference intensities and distortional influences. At the same time, that line and analyst knows nothing without di deep exploration, both of the patient's associations and his own countertransference. It needs to be understood that I too will try to help my patient to explore the way in which he experiences me. Only, it is not because I believe in his ability to gain clear insight into my internal world at the moment, but because I wish to help him to explore, in the transference relation to me, his anxieties, unconscious fantasies, and projections. It is this exploration, and its interpretation by me, that will hopefully help him to gain better access to his internal struggles, to reality, and to the other. The saner, stronger part of the personality of the patient and his good internal objects, including the internalized uh, good object of the containing analyst, are all considered by, as taking active part in the effort to gradually abandon the dominance of distortional relations on behalf of real intimacy, trust, and reparation gained by the resolution of the depressive position. From a Kleinian point of view, it is only then that there is much more room for the mutual meeting of minds that is the royal road towards health in the relational analysis. I will now turn to the question of self-disclosure. As early as 1912, Freud war warned analysts against bringing their own individuality freely into the discussion. In the relational corpus itself, we also find repeated warnings against the too free use of self-disclosure and against the radical interpretations and applications of the postmodern term raised by Mills today. Relational writers also remind us that self-disclosure is to some degree always a part of our communication. I agree. Nevertheless, self-disclosure is much less applicable as an in initiated tool in the Kleinian method, for different reasons from those described by Mills. Although I speak with my patients all the time about my part in the transference relations, I don't tend to share my internal reactions with my patient because I don't want to lessen the flames of the transference and the intensity of the projections by exposing my countertransference. On the contrary, I wish to follow Betty Joseph's recommendation to keep the transference heat as high as possible as long as it takes in order to be able to thoroughly work them through. It may sometimes sound quite similar in this session. If, for instance, a patient has felt that she has made me angry, I might say, for example, so now that I'm angry, you can be relieved that I'm totally awake and will not desert you. I was not denying her perception of me, but I'm not interested in further illuminating my subjectivity. Rather, I prefer to illuminate her urge to project her anger into me as a defense against her anxiety to be left alone, deserted by a dead or destructed object. To give my example a combined Klein and relational formulation, one could say that from a Klein and point of view, it is not the true self of the analyst nor the sub subjectivity of the other that is explored, but the false perception of the analyst's subjectivity that is loaded by the patient's projections and the underlying anxieties and unconscious fantasies. And as Steiner said, the central aim is to enable the patient to reclaim her lost parts that were located in the analyst through projective identification. Lastly, I could not agree more with Lou Aaron's statement that the important thing about each and every intervention, including self-disclosure, is not whether it promotes autonomy or relation, but whether it opens or blocks analytic interrogation. I am certain that in both methods, relational and Kleinian, patients are helped enormously, as long as their analysts use their tools in a genuine and responsible way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Merav. And now, Boaz Shalgi. Wow. 
One more to go. Out of the many, many points in Dr. Mills' papers, it could be and should be more carefully discussed, I would like to use my brief discussion to look again at what seems to me to be the foundation of all of Dr. Mills' arguments, that is the concept of truth and meaning. To be able to present my argument, I would like to suggest that any comprehensive theory regarding the nature of human existence and experience must include three dimensions, subjectivity, intersubjectivity, and objectivity. And that every moment of our life, including, of course, every moment in a therapeutic session, can be looked upon and consists of these three dimensions. As Dr. Mills mentioned in his lecture, The German Idealism and Phen Phenomenology, which means first and foremost Hegel phenomenological system, it seems to me important to mention that in my own work, I found in this very phenomenology, I mean Hegel phenomenology of mind, a system that finds a way to hold these three dimensions together. And more importantly, to do so without giving precedence, kdimut, to any of them, which seems to me the most important thing about it. Coming back to the clinic, this means that when a patient is talking to me about his mother, A, he has a mother, a specific woman who she and only she gave birth to him, and should she enter the room now, he would recognize her, while I would not. The objective dimension, B, that he has a specific, unique, and particular way of experiencing his mother that belongs to him and to no one else based on a lifetime spent with her the subjective dimension, and see that while he talks about her with me now, considering who he is and who I am, considering who his mother is and who my mother is, considering his and my internal objects and the specific ways in which they encounter and co-create each other, his mother is being created again. That means the intersubjective dimension, which is no less true to what she is. So as I already mentioned, Dr. Mills' critique of relational psychoanalysis is to my mind first and foremost a critic of the concept of truth, which lies at its core. Dr. Mills is warning us time and again of the hazards and pitfalls which are entwined within the intersubjective concept of truth. By equating intersubjectivity with postmodernism, an equation I and some other people here strongly reject, Dr. Mills claims, and this claim I strongly join and support, that if we adapt a view that sees the truth of what happens in analysis as only being co-created now and again, moment after moment, by the specific singular encounter of any particular dyad, we will lose the ground on which therapy can take place. Putting it very simply, we may say that if we let the truth of the feeling, thoughts, fantasies, and sensation of our patients be determined only by the mere intersubjective creation of the moment, we might forget that the patient have a past, a history, that he or she has subjective dynamics that dominate her or his inner worlds, which, for example, has brought them to therapy. Thus, we might find ourselves in a world of Borges or Lewis Carroll, in which one cannot hold on to meanings, perception, and ideas that exist beyond a fleeting kaleidoscopic moment. Indeed, Listening to Dr. Mill's critique might make us long for the old, reassuring, and comforting concept of modernism. One can hardly avoid the compelling power of the modern concept of truth, uh, which seems strong and unquestionable. There is a truth there waiting to be discovered. An objective observer can look carefully and discover the truth that exists, more apparent or concealed, within the object of his scrutiny. Yet if this compelling concept had been proven problematic in the physical sciences, it has been proven disastrous in the human sciences. And most of all, in regard to this method that has as its higher purpose the struggle for psychic change called psychoanalysis. The grounds of this misfortune lie in the heart of the objectivist perspective. When one operates from this perspective, one tries to see things as they are and not as they become. The blessing that relational psychoanalysis brought to the therapeutic endeavor is the opportunity to look 
not at structure, but at processes. When one looks at structure, one tries to discover and describe them. And when doing so, one finds himself, perhaps unnoticeably, preserving what he sees and ignoring the interminable dimension of process, change, and becoming, which is immanent to what is going on and makes it, for example, transference or repetition, not only a replica of the past, but a particular and unique event that is taking place at that moment and within this context. Let us look, for example, at an angry patient. I'm not Kleinian, but <laughs> angry patient. <laughs> we, we didn't uh, coordinate that. He's angry, perhaps, because I touched an unresolved Oedipal cord. And that filled him with guilt and anxiety he can only experience and express as anger. Or he's angry because in the last session, I, as a self-object, failed to recognize a basic need a hidden part of his most sensitive and vulnerable self. Or he's angry because he has learned to hate the link, in my, the Bionian link. In my interpretation, trying to hold feelings together makes him fearful. So now he's angry. And I, as an observer, and in accordance with my own psychoanalytic beliefs and education, try to locate the seeds of the anger. Perhaps helping him to see those seeds, acknowledge, acknowledge them, treat them compassionately. The patient may see that. It might help him. But here's the thing. The patient is not angry. He's angry at me. And when he's angry at me, whatever the objective reason of that anger, and whatever the subjective psychological dynamic that produced the anger, he's not angry as he's always angry. He's angry at me. Since I am who I am, his anger is not only being discovered, but is just as well being created anew between who is and who I am. The anger is not a replica of the past. It is, in Thomas Ogden's words, the present moment of the past, a newly created past, a newly created anger. If I am to help the patient not just understand his anger, but also emerge to new ways of experiencing it, I must relate to that intersubjective creation of the anger as no less important. This is why the problem with Dr. Mill's argument is not that he criticizes the precedence of intersubjectivity, but he endorses the precedence of objectivity. Dr. Mills is right. The patient is objectively angry. And yes, none of us would attempt to fly out of this building by flapping her or his arm. Yes. Yet, if men could not imagine doing so, being the dream unrealistically, Dr. Mills would not be able to fly here today and talk with us. He would not be able to fly into this building. Of course, objective reality exists. I don't think that anyone really defies that. Yet we should be, 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 uh, be very so worry of giving it precedence over the subjective or intersubjective dimensions of human existence. The psychoanalyst and philosopher Marcia Cavell wrote, very, very favorite quote of mine, I, I liked it very much. She says, there is a talk now of the way in which analyst and patient co-construct reality. Well, if it, each, each of us co-constructs uh, construct a picture of reality, reality is what keeps putting us back to the drawing board. Well, this is true. Objectivist reality is what holds us to the drawing board. But objective reality would be meaningless unless the subjective and intersubjective dimension could picture it again and again, each time with new and fresh meaning. Objective, objective reality as such, objective reality of our patient would be hollow, ghostly replica of itself, unless subjective reality and intersubjective reality infused it with life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, boys. So um, I guess we're moving on uh, into the discussion. And I think that first, of course, uh, Dr. John Mill, um, there's a microphone just beside you over there. Maybe you can take it. Thank you so much. So I guess this is a lot to, uh, to kind of 
take in and, uh, and process, but I, I do want to invite you to, to comment and take as much time as, as you need, and then we'll open, open up for discussion with the audience. Okay. Well, I was very impressed um, with the panel's um, uh, critique of me, um, which tells me I, I must have accomplished something. That, that you would take me serious enough to, uh, to do this. Um, it also gives me a sense of hope that uh, we, can, we can regenerate, um, reliven ideas in the field and still have differences of opinion. Um, I, must, uh, I must admit that, that, that there's going to be, always going to be certain tensions in the way we think and, and we're coming from different um, backgrounds and philosophical dis disciplines, not to mention psychoanalytic ones. Um, uh, but I, I think there's a, sp a spirit of, uh, uh, at, least, at least I'm hoping there's a spirit here of, of trying to um, find some kind of way of unifying these dis disparate points of view whether that be within an analytic uh, sensibility from, from different practitioners' points of view, or whether it be from a philosophical one. Um, just briefly, um, you know, it, it's, it's fair to say that, I, that I, I could be accused of ad hominems and straw man arguments to tear down my opponents. It's, uh, the greater intent, though, is to, to look at what people are saying and critique it. Um, I, I don't. Um, I don't particularly want to be uh, remembered for uh, for that. But but nevertheless, um, the the thought for me is that there's a there's a rich complexity of ideas that are just waiting to be mined. And on one hand, I think as uh, what psychoanalysis suffers from is certain kind of guild mentalities. Uh, and that they stay very insular and isolated without having dialogue among oneself. Of course, the relational uh, movement has, has challenged that and, and to that which I think uh, you know, we're all grateful for. Um, but there's always going to be differences of points of view. Um, the notion um, of different epistemologies is extremely well taken. And um, I, I happen to agree with what most everybody has said here today. Um, you have to keep in mind that just because I'm looking at critiquing postmodernism in this very in this context, um, it doesn't mean that I don't value certain elements of what postmodern thought has brought in to uh, to, to the table to discuss. Um, in fact, I think it'd be helpful to know. Um, for the audience to know that I, I have very much tried to offer a, an overall um, meta psychoanalytic metaphysics in, in a number of my works, um, which, which is not polarizing uh, the phenomenal or the epistemological point of view, but it's trying to incorporate it within an overarching ontology. And so... Um, a lot of the, the binaries that I might have generated in my talk, which would stimulate uh, negative reactions or, or critiques, um, doesn't really exist uh, in a formal sense for me. It's, that, um, it's the details that I think philosophers like to you know, critique and they like to debate about and they like to argue about. So um, uh, being, uh, you know, putting that out that of course there's gonna be certain postmodern thinkers that have different points of view. And w we can't really dialogue about every single philosopher. I mean, you, if, if you're sitting around uh, with a bunch of philosophers who have their own identifications, they're going to basically be in constant debate about, about fundamentals. And that's what's f in many ways fun and uh, invigorating about, about uh, having discussions. Um, so, but I did want to clear up that uh, uh, Levon's uh, comment about me not putting examples out on the postmodern thinking, uh, it's, it's very, I think, very thoroughly documented in my book, Conundrums. So I, I, I am relying upon what people have written in 
and I think he is correct, in North American English-speaking journals, analytic journals, where a variety of, um, a variety of analysts don't have uh, a philosophical background, let alone formal training in. And then this may have led to um, simplifications or overstatements or things that I was um, uh, wanting to draw attention to. Obviously, in this part of the world, you have uh, different points of view. Uh, which and more sophisticated points of view, which I'm, I'm glad to see. Um, but but I, I would like uh, to just acknowledge that um, I'm in agreement with uh, I think every everything that was said here about me, uh, yeah, and, and and appreciate it, yeah. and, and also appreciate I, I wasn't like uh, you know whipped and tied. But uh, <laughs> but I think that's enough for me. I'll turn it over to the others or the audience.